盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘 ，Sidecast。Part two: Further analysis and discussion. Now, Rutger, one of the things you mention in、um, chapter nine when you're discussing the kind of random easters and the、um, uh, random contr- controlled random test is it? Randomized controlled trials, yeah. Randomized controlled trials. Sorry, one of the things you mention in chapter nine when you're discussing those、mm-hmm. is、um, uh, you you discuss the idea of you know people have this aim, which is to Improve school attendance, right? We all, you know, charities always want to do this,、mm-hmm. and it turns out the random easters tell us that the best way to do this is simply spend ten dollars per child on deworming them, right?、Mm-hmm. So children、mm-hmm. no longer have, feel stomach aches from de- worms, etc., and they spend an extra just short of three years in school.、Um, giving kids free school uniforms doesn't do this, and Giving kids free、um, school meals does it nearly as effective, but it's about ten times more expensive.、Mm-hmm. And there's a great quote, and you say this: you say, "No armchair philosopher could have predicted that."、Mm-hmm. Uh, and now, as you know, we're kind of a philosophy podcast, and both you know do lots of philosophy. I was wondering, if, do you ever think that there is a role here within these sorts of debates that philosophy? Should have, or do you think we should just give mostly everything over to the random easters? Well, I think any good philosopher would love the random easters, right? It goes、yeah. back to、uh, Burton Russell's point about the will to doubt. I mean, we have so many intuitions and beliefs, and we're so often in love with our own ideas,、mm-hmm. and and we、we'll、think, yeah, this is reasonable. That sounds right. And what the re- random easters realize is that you just got to try a lot of crazy different things. And so often, reality surprises you, and then you'll find out that yeah, indeed, deworming kids is really, really cheap, and it's incredibly, incredibly effective if you want to、uh, to help them to actually attend schools.、Um, so yeah, I mean,、uh, if if philosophy is about radical doubt, then、uh, then I think、uh, most philosophers would love th- this this kind of approach. Okay, cool. Yeah, good. I think, especially when reading books like yours, actually doing learning about history and some、uh, findings in psychology and social science, they're massively beneficial.、Um, yeah, I definitely.、Think. I mean, in my work, I've always tried to be, you know, really, really interdisciplinary.、Hmm. I think this is one of the tragedies of the modern university, is that it's. I mean, even though there's a lot of talk about, you know, being being interdisciplinary or trying to do that.、Um, You know, in reality, what I saw when I was still in university、uh, and and con- trying to, you know, considering where, whether I should do a PhD, you know, I saw I saw a lot of really really smart people focusing on very very small, and to be honest, very very boring questions.、Mm-hmm. <laughs> and、uh, it's only when you're you're much older, maybe when you're tenured, when you're a professor, that you can finally get some breathing space, yeah,、um, and to do different things. But by then, you know. Your best years are already behind you.、Mm-hmm. So I've always thought that we should have some kind of program, some kind of interdisciplinary PhD programs,、mm-hmm. where people are also allowed to do different things. You know, where they're not, where they're not forced to publish in some kind of journal these articles that no one's ever going to read,、mm-hmm. but you know, maybe write one book for for a broader audience, or、mm-hmm. ask one bigger question and and maybe、uh, look at this question from different perspectives. I mean, it's a different intellectual challenge,、uh, and and you both need the specialists and the generalists. But nowadays, there's hardly any room for people who try to to be the generalist.、Um, I mean, there are hardly any institutions that they can go to, apart from、uh, you know corrupt think tanks, <laughs>、uh, <laughs> where they're being financed by the billionaires, right? Yeah.、Um, yeah. So that that is really one of the tra- tragedies, I think, of the modern university. Well, a question kind of linking in all of these interdisciplinary kind of bit of history and a bit of literary analysis here, as well some philosophy and on the topic of your book, a bit of a、mm. long-winded one, so you'll you'll bear with me here.、Um, you cited Karl Marx in chapter six of your book, talking about leisure, 
and uh, Marx looked forward to a similar day of leisure and you give the quote from Marx saying society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow to hunt in the morning fish in the afternoon rear cattle in the evening and criticize after dinner mm -hmm. Uh, Long-term listeners of the podcast will remember that back in episode 26, we did a deep analysis of Marx, and this quote came up in some depth. And we found that Engels was writing this passage, and his neat handwriting, and then, um, so he wrote, it's possible for me to do one thing today, another tomorrow. And then in Marx's scruffy handwriting, um, he just annotates it and puts, criticize after dinner. And <laughs> the, I forget the name of the Japanese scholar, but the idea here is that Marx came back after dinner, saw what Engels had wrote, and just like said, ah, we don't really believe this. So a kind of, that's a off the beat way of trying to get into this point. Here's an, an examined point, which I was thinking when we we're looking at the book. The experiments discussed in the book show that uh, the laziness contention is ill-founded. So the idea that people on a basic income uh, will work less. What we mm -hmm. found is people will work more. But in this chapter on leisure, you're making the case that it's a great loss post-1980 that we're losing this leisure time. The point of basic income, you say, is to give us more time for things that matter. Mm -hmm. But the studies you cite show us that we're just going to end up working just as much. Is there a contention here between these two ideas or have I, have I missed the buck? Well, what I should have made clear, I think, in my book is that what I'm trying to do is to redefine work. Hmm. Right? So when we use the word work, uh, we often refer to an activity that gets you a salary. You know, you make money and you, you pay taxes and you're in a hierarchical relationship with an employer, blah, blah, blah. And that's what we call work. Uh, what we don't call work is caring for our kids. Right. or caring for the elderly, or volunteers work. Uh, we don't include that in, in, in GDP, for example. It doesn't add to economic growth. Um, and that's the thing I'm really trying to question, because there is a lot of paid work that is not very valuable. Mm -hmm. I, I talk about this whole idea of socially useless jobs, or mm -hmm. BS jobs, as some people <laughs> call them, um, that don't add anything of value. People themselves are saying about their own jobs, well, you know, I don't contribute anything. If I would go on strike, no one cares. Mm. Well, if all the care workers would go on strike, that would be horrible, mm. right? We, we couldn't do without them. If all the garbage collectors go on strike, we, we, we can't handle that. I've got, yeah. I've got one story in the book, actually, where that happened in, in 1968. The New York story? Yeah, indeed. And um, that lasted for six days, and then the state of emergency had to be declared. And, <laughs> you know, you really can't do without garbage collectors. Mm. And um, one other story in the book is about a strike of bankers in Ireland in 1970. Mm. That strike lasted for six months. So not six days, but six months. <laughs> and, uh, well, nothing much happened. So um, the, the bankers came back after after all those months and said, oh, all right, all right, all right, we'll get back to work. Mm. Um so that's what I'm really trying to do in the book is to to question our mm. our, our our concept of work. What is work? And that that's what we need to rethink quite radically. Mm -hmm. Maybe this um, question ties in then to the kind of um, questioning the concept of work because it was a another potential kind of conflict that I thought arose mm -hmm. in discussing universal basic income and another interesting fact you tell us. So in the book you tell us one of, not one of, in fact, the most detrimental thing to a person's health is long-term unemployment. It is yeah. more detrimental to a person's health than the loss of a loved one to cancer or the loss of one's uh, wife or terrible things that can happen yeah, to people's yeah. lives. Long-term unemployment is the worst. Um, but then do we not have this um, pe peculiar kind of conflict here that we go, well, how do we try and alleviate some of these problems? Well, we give people money, right? Universal basic mm -hmm. income. Well, maybe the kind of, you know, you know, the more, more communist in me says, no, don't give them money, give them a job. And that mm -hmm. alleviates the problem of long-term unemployment. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Well, my point here is that if you have a society that totally revolves around paid work, where basically everyone is forced uh, into a paid job, where the whole educational system is about get a job, get an income, earn as much money as possible, uh, and do that as quickly as possible. You know, where, where we call success is almost synonymous with earning 
earning a lot of money. Even though you consider your own job completely useless, you know, you're writing reports no one's ever going to read, you're sending emails to people you hate, you're building financial products that destroy wealth, you're, you know, you're coming up with algorithms to, to let people click more on ads. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter, we call you successful. Yeah. Um, in that kind of society, if you do not have a job, if you can't participate in this whole system and people consider you like almost some kind of parasite yeah. and the government treats you as such obviously you're going to get depressed mm -hmm. obviously and and long-term employment is one of the worst things out there mm -hmm. but what i'm arguing for is a society where everyone has this venture capital and can decide mm -hmm. for themselves what they want to do in their lives mm -hmm. and where they can redefine work and where we rely on intrinsic motivation instead of extrinsic motivation, you know, where we where we do what we also, um, you know, trust our kids to do. No one mm -hmm. no one pays a kid a kid to learn how to walk. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that human beings are naturally creative. We are inherently, uh, you know, we is a species that wants to explore, wants to do different things, wants to learn. Mm -hmm. It's only society that beats all these habits out of us. Right. Um, so in that sense, I'm very Rousseauian. <laughs> you could argue. Um, I think that I think that there's 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 nothing inevitable about we're doing this right now. The point, rather, is it's not that long-term unemployment is bad for you. It's the worst thing for you. Sorry, it's that long-term unemployment in a society that perpetually and constantly demonizes those people out of work. Yeah, and and boxes them off and segregates them and puts them in certain areas and makes them go through um, a welfare system that is rigged against them. Yeah. That is the detrimental thing, exactly. not the yeah. intrinsic th being of unemployed, yeah. because you could be you know, unemployed and then still do great things not considered work yeah. in that uh, society. In which yeah, and people want to contribute, you know. They want to contribute to the common good. Uh, and then if you have an ideology which says you're not contributing... You're, you're, you know, you're a scrounger. Hmm. Uh, other people are working for you, and you should be grateful for that. I mean, that is so depressing. Uh, but then, if we would redefine work, and if we could get rid of, if we, if we, you know, or, or if we would say work is just paid work, then, then I would lo love to move towards a society that has full unemployment. You know, where <laughs> we just get rid of all the work, and yeah. we re rely on people themselves to make their own choices. Sounds utopian right now, but I think we already have the technology and the means to do it. It's just ideology that, that is holding us back. I love this punchy sentence in the end of chapter four where you wrote, uh, we'll force claimants to perform pointless tasks even if it bankrupts us. Um, so there's this idea in the public consciousness, kind of what you're talking about here, that we can't have a society running on handouts. But the studies that you're citing sh are showing us that actually we kind of make a net profit if anything we, we save money when we, we hand this money out and it perhaps gives us more meaning and allows us to focus get rid of these bs jobs and do mm -hmm. more worthwhile yeah, exactly, exactly i mean just think about it there's a recent poll now from two dutch economists they rely on a data set of thirty thousand employees from more than 40 countries mm -hmm. where they ask people the question do you think your job adds anything of value to society 25 percent wasn't sure 25%, right? So mm. what's the unemployment rate right now? Is it 5 6%, something like that? Yeah. So we're talking about something way bigger than traditional unemployment. And mm -hmm. these people have have received an extraordinary amount of education. We paid mm -hmm. billions yeah. to educate them to do these jobs. You know, they went to business school, uh, all these kind of stupid organization consultancy studies. And, and, and then they went on to do a job where we actually pay them a big salary as well. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, they say, I'm not adding anything of value. Just just think about how crazy that is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that it's, it's, it sounds communist to me. Mm -hmm. uh, in the old Soviet Union, if you would buy a piece of bread, there would be one person who, who sold the bread to you, one person who gave you the receipt, one people <laughs> back, uh, person who, who, uh, you know, who put it in a bag for you. <laughs> it's, uh, it was extraordinarily inefficient just yeah. to make sure that everyone has a job. Well, you know, if I look at modern capitalism, it's, it looks pretty similar to me, to be honest. Isn't there a moral point here? I just want to drop in a couple of thinkers that you, I'm sure you're familiar with already. We've got this um, John Locke's idea, the great mm -hmm. 17th century English philosopher who thought that things become ours, we acquire property by mixing our labor with them. 
and Robert Nozick, who is mm-hmm. very much on the opposite end of what you're discussing here, a 20th century American philosopher, and his book Anarchy, State and Utopia, um, he argues for this minimal state, limited to narrow functions. I've got a quote here from uh, limited functions of protection against force, theft, fraud, enforcement of contracts, and so on. And um, he's saying that the government shouldn't overstep these limits, otherwise it's going to infringe on some of our basic rights or liberties. And he likens uh, taxation with slavery, saying that it gets to imagine two people, one who works longer hours to gain income to buy a movie ticket, and the other who decides not to work those hours but engage in some leisure time. Mm-hmm. And he says, what's the difference between seizing this man's leisure and seizing this man's goods? He says, there's no difference it's just slavery. Mm-hmm. So wh- how would you respond to this, this idea that taxation is inherently immoral and uh, it mm-hmm. infringes on our liberties when we sign the contract? I would say that the opposite if tr- is true. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Davos, you know, at the World Economic Forum. Mm. Mm. The people you meet there, a lot of them have are extraordinarily rich mm-hmm. uh, and have businesses with business models that are just about, about extraction. You know, not paying their workers a living wage, polluting the environment, coming up with these destructive financial products that I already mentioned. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's about what economists call rent seeking. You're not really creating anything. You're not really com- contributing, but you're taking the wealth from someone else. And that is your business model. Right. Um, I think taxes can play a wonderful role here because you want to discourage the things that you don't like that are socially wasteful or socially destructive. Mm. Uh, that's what what taxes are meant to do and what you don't want to do is tax all the great things in life right so i'm i would be very much in favor of lower taxes on for care workers and garbage collectors etc 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 because because they're doing such great work it yeah it really depends on um on how you define work and i think that that's what goes wrong with with these these kind of philosophers uh like nozick is that they don't really have a grasp of what the what the economic system actually looks like. So again, what you need here is some interdisciplinarity. You need to look at what's a- what's actually going on in the real wor- world. What are people actually doing um, to earn their money? And then the other thing, obviously, is that you have all different kind of taxes. So you can you can work for your money, but you can also just inherit it, right? Or you can just uh, have a lot of wealth and then collect rents. Um, what I would say is that we need uh, taxes on laziness um, to make sure that everyone, uh, you know, works for their own money. This is a classic 19th century liberal argument uh, mm-hmm. is that, you know, uh, you need high taxes on inheritance. Back back in the 19th century, we had, we had this whole class of, of people who had, who, with old money who were basically doing nothing. That's what Thomas Piketty wrote about in his famous book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, where he argues that we're actually going back to the 19th century. So if you want to keep capitalism uh, productive, if you want to make sure that people are actually working for the money, you need to constantly readjust because the system is itself is unstable. And if you right. have a minimalist state then and you do nothing, then you go back to this renter society where you mm-hmm. have a, a lot of, well, basically parasites at the top who are mm-hmm. sucking the rest of us, uh, <laughs> you know, where the, who are basically um, taking all our wealth. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. What, what, what happens. So in the epilogue of the, uh, the UK first edition translation of your book, you offer mm-hmm. kind of it's, uh, this interesting diagnosis, right, of the liberal left and suggest that a new strategy or tactic is needed, basically. So you say, until now, what the liberal left socialists have been doing has been to act as some sort of uh, self-appointed moral compass or restraint on a more progressive or possibly forward-looking right. So as you say, you say, reining in and restraining the opposition, that's the sole remaining mission of the underdog socialist, anti-privatization, anti-establishment, anti-austerity. Mm-hmm. Given everything that they're against, one is left to wonder what the underdog socialist is ac- actually for. Your proposed solution is to kind of offer this narrative that speaks to ordinary people, but that doesn't and that doesn't seem to alienate them in any way, and that it seemed to me at least that doesn't want to obviously just uh, do the kind of emotional plea of typical Mm -hmm. kind of left-leaning politics. Instead, you say that we should kind of 
just wholeheartedly adopt the language, maybe not wholeheartedly, mm-hmm. of the kind of progressive right and go, look, we'll use this against you almost. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the evidence suggests, as I've shown in the book, this is what we should do. Mm-hmm. Well, you may have heard in our conversation that I sometimes used almost like right-wing language to defend mm. progressive ideals. Right? For example, poverty. Poverty is just too expensive. Mm. We can't afford it. It's wasteful. Therefore, we should just eradicate it and we'll have a great return on yeah. investment. Yeah. It's sort of t- talking like a, like a CEO. Yeah. Um, that is what we call moral reframing. And I think it can be a very, very important strategy. There's a book... Um, called The Righteous Mind by philosopher, or I should say psychologist, uh, Jonathan Haidt, Mm -hmm. uh, that really opened my eyes to this. Uh, In the book, he argues that people have different moral senses. You know, it's it's based on on very rigorous empirical work. But he shows that that morality is basically like the human tongue. So we taste all that kind of different things, like whether something is bitter or sweet or you name it. Uh, And he says that in morality, the same thing is going on. So we have different dimensions that we care about. For mm-hmm. example, uh, respect for, for, for hierarchy and mm-hmm. authority, um, uh, our longing for community uh, and, and being loyal to one another, uh, caring for the poor, caring for the weak. And, and so he has six of these things. And what he points out is that the left actually uh, has a very one-dimensional way of framing moral issues. It, it, mm. it only talks about basically about freedom and about caring for each other. And it doesn't talk about, you know, the authority, about sanctity, uh, you know, about just respecting th- certain things. And and uh, it's, it's not very varied, right? Um, and this is what I try to do better in my book. So also, for example, when it comes to nationalism, a lot of people on the left say, oh, I'm against nationalism or I'm mm-hmm. against patriotism. Well, I think that that would actually be be a bit stupid i would say that that you got to make the argument that um we're a wonderful country we can be the first country that goes 100 percent sustainable energy um you know i'm from holland we were the first country in the world with gay marriage and i'm really mm. proud of that um we are the first country in the world with more uh liberal laws around something like euthanasia which was a very very difficult subject but we had yeah. a good discussion about it and um and that worked out in the end so that is the, that is a different way of, of framing the same ideas in order to get more people on board, uh, but it's hard work. Uh, yeah, it can be quite can be quite difficult sometimes. The other thing that I would that I would say is that you got to talk in a language that everyone understands. Mm-hmm. You know, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, I, I decided to study history because I thought it was easy, <laughs> and uh, to be honest, I still think it's relatively easy. Um, I always try to write my books in a way, to, you know, that everyone can understand it, that mm-hmm. has a, at least got a little bit of education. Yeah. And uh, that is difficult. It's often way, way easier to make something more complex than, than to make something complex a bit easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's worth it. And uh, what happens so often, uh, also, and maybe especially uh, on the left and on the academic left, I should say, is that people say, oh, it's so complex. You haven't, you know, you haven't really understand how, you know, neoliberalism these days, and it's, it's so adaptive and capitalism, and, and oh, your, your analysis sounds very nice and all, but no, it's not going to work out. We still need, mm-hmm. you know, we still need to do another co- um, years and years of work <laughs> in the ivory tower. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm not really interested in that anymore. And what I also find encouraging is that there are people right now, like, for example, how old is she? 29 years old, the congresswoman, AOC. Mm-hmm. Um, she has this wonderful ability to make complex things, you know, easy to understand for everyone. Top marginal mm-hmm. tax rate? Oh, it's just if you are more than 10 million, you start paying a higher tax rate. Very good idea. We had it in the past as well. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of politics that I'm interested in much more yeah, than, yeah. Uh, than staying on the sidelines, uh, sidelines being understood by no one. A listener questions segment. Mm. Um, thank you to everyone who sent us a listener's question. We'll just do a couple here. I think you've got one from Lauren Cravens in the USA there, Greg. Mm-hmm. Lauren says, Rutger, hey, dude, why are you so attractive? You look literally look like Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I guess um, 
that's uh, that's the problem with my the the uh, author photograph that was taken for my book. Uh, <laughs> that has almost nothing to do with how I look in reality. I'm afraid. It might get you a movie role. This is this is the thing that they do for your books. Is <laughs> I don't know. It's something with Photoshop. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, I think you'll be really really disappointed if you meet me in reality. <laughs> Uh, second question from Samuel Davis in the USA. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to ask Bregman a question. I'm 100% on board with Utopia for Realists, but I don't know how I, I don't know what I need to do to bring about these huge changes. Any advice? Second question, if you have time. I like that you included biblical examples in the book. Are you a Christian? And do you think Christians should be supporting the political changes you propose? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, let me start with the last question. Are you a Christian? As I, I, I mean, I said at the beginning of the podcast that I lost my faith. Hmm. But in many ways, my book is a Christian book, or it's a, it's a religious book, because it's about the power of hope. And it's about, about the power of belief, and that hmm. certain things can become reality if you build a movement around it, and if you really believe in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I can understand why, why some people might might ask that question. Uh, always when people ask me about my father, you know, being a Protestant minister, nowadays I would say that, you know, the difference between the two of us is not that big and it's not mm. very relevant. It would just be a different framing of the same ideas, yeah. uh, I would say. Um, then the other thing, what can you contribute? I have no clue. I have no <laughs> idea. I mean, I'm not some kind of, <laughs> some kind of CEO that organizes everything. Uh, people have a hundred, uh, hundreds of different abilities and, and talents and whatever, and they can contribute in so many ways. Hmm. Uh, and what I've been, what's been really exciting for me is that I got literally hundreds of emails of people saying that they quit their job after reading my book. Wow! And <laughs> I, I had no idea. I have no idea whether that, that that's a good idea, but uh, I mean, it's up to them. They're the real experts, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just as it, it's not up to me to say what the poor should do with their lives. Should just give them money and let them decide for themselves, and uh, the same is true for you. So, um, uh, yeah, I uh, I have no idea what you should do, but you you, uh, you you can uh, you can perfectly answer that question for yourself. You know how you can contribute with your talents and your abilities. Thank you, thank you to everyone who submitted a listener question as well. You can always submit future listener questions for our future guests on our website. A round of concluding remarks. Concluding remarks. I loved what you said in Davos, so I had high hopes for our interview, but you turned out to be far dumber, more dogmatic and less impressive than <laughs> I expected. You're a professional academic, so I guess I should not be surprised, but it's still disappointing, Rutko. Also, for what it's worth, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the listeners who aren't aware of that, um, it, that's a quote from Tucker Carlson, the host of uh, Fox News. Um, I just, I love that uh, you're sending these ripples that, like you say, you're, uh, it's important that we get out there and we talk about these ideas in a way that the public can and understand and engage. And like what you said at Davos and um, how you, you rile up these, um, these hosts, you are going against the zeitgeist of the time. So what I will say is my one worry is that people, you know, if, if you believe the rhetoric that's sold, especially in British media, is that people don't want abstract thought or experts. They want common sense approaches. And what you set out in Utopia for Realists academically is excellent because it goes against these, these deep rooted intuitions that we have. But from, if, if you understand the media, it's the mm -hmm. Jack and the Jill on the street don't want this. They want things that they already know to be true. Mm -hmm. That's that's my worry, but I'm on board with. I guess is it desirable? Yes. Is it achievable? Uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, to pinch your own word there. And I think I took a lot from the book personally as well. It's interesting you say that lots of people write to you and say that they've they've quit your jobs when mm -hmm. I've been reading this for the last couple of weeks and going back through different passages. And what I found is in my day to day life now, I'm finding more time for leisure and things that I enjoy, things that are meaningful and. There's no point in doing these things just for the sake of doing them. Uh, it's just, that was just a, a really good reminder how I ought to be living my life in a, in a moral sense. I won't give the quote directly, but like you say, the, there is this. We should be aware of the historical perspective because when mm. we're looking at moral philosophy, borders are the greatest thing, the biggest driver of inequality uh, throughout all of human history. And if you really want to engage in moral philosophy, and make a difference, you kind of need to um, fess up or or respond to this this problem which is out there which is the biggest cause of of poverty and um yeah yeah and inequality and and be hopeful and be radical and be a little bit patient at the same time so when you talk about what the let, let's say the common man in the street thinks hmm. 
remember that common sense is just just this thing that <laughs> this whole process of brainwashing that's been going on for decades and there's nothing inevitable or natural about that hmm. uh, again it can all change uh, and that is that is the job of philosophers that is the job of intellectuals to change common sense hmm. it's hard but it's possible I should uh, thank Greg as well. Often the messenger gets shot. Thank you, Greg, for recommending that we read the book and that we interview it. Could you <laughs> concluding remarks, Greg? Uh, no, yeah, I'm glad we, uh, uh, you know, did read the book and then spoke to Rutger. It's been incredibly illuminating, really good fun. Um, I mean, I remember reading the book quite a while ago now and then I was really impressed by it. And So similar to the Robert Wright interview that we did uh, a few weeks back, and maybe being hit over the head is the wrong phrase, but <laughs> someone who considers themselves a bit more of an armchair philosopher, right? right. There's just the barrage of empirical data yeah. is kind of like, it's um, it's electrifying, right? It's <laughs> like, here are these things that randomesis tell us. Bang, that's gone. Bang, that's gone. In fact, worming, this is a thing. Mm. And the book is full of this stuff. And I just found it so kind of, refreshing and um, forceful for instance the kind of the seven points you make in the kind of chapter about open borders it's just like here are these objections one might like even try think of them as like proper premised philosophical arguments mm -hmm. right and then you go no evidence against it no evidence against it no evidence against it and then when you just take a moment to like think about them for instance the kind of paradox of open borders it's, it's it's completely obvious that if you were to militarize a border and make it harder for people to pass over, they would minimize the risk of passing over the border by only going once. And then you kind of take this step back and you go, oh, great, this is brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, more empirical data. And then that just makes me question my place as an armchair philosopher more. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the existential But process. yeah, it was great. I loved reading it. It's brilliant. Thing. Rick, have you got time for a, a quick game? We have a quick quiz at the end of our show. <laughs> Depends on the questions. <laughs> pop, 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 pop. Philosophy quiz. It's called uh, Taxes, 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 All the Rest is Bullshit. <laughs> For the listeners who's unaware, there's a discussion at the Davos World Economic Forum recently, and uh, and, and Rutger said this uh, famous, which is kind of becoming a little bit of a meme at the moment. <laughs> I'm going to give you, and Greg, you can play along as well, because you haven't seen the questions. Okay. I'm going to give you the name of the person, and you tell me whether you think they, they pay their taxes, or whether it's BS and they haven't been paying their taxes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so you, your first one is Nicolas Cage. Um, oh, he pays his taxes. Yeah. Rick. Nicholas Cage. He pay, yeah, he pays tax. Um, he doesn't. Well, in 2009, he was hit with a <laughs> $6.2 $6 a million dollar bill, rather, from the IRS for back taxes. Oops. Yeah, so I, both, neither of you get that one. Um, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, Amazon CEO. Well, he doesn't pay it. No. Amazon, oh. like, paid zero in federal tax dollars, over $11 billion in profit. Yeah, for the second year in a row as well. It's incredible. It's really bizarre. I almost couldn't believe it when I saw it. Saw it. I mean, I've been reading and writing about this stuff for a long time, but zero in Texas. That's oh. incredible. Well, the silver so lining, you've got a second point in the quiz, if that's anything. To, <laughs> if that's a silver lining to the problem of taxes. Huh. Um, Elizabeth II, Queen of England, does she pay taxes? Uh, no, she's a queen. Is she had a... Is no, she, no, 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 no taxes, I think. Uh, the queen is not legally required to pay. However, she's voluntary paid income tax... Uh, Philanthropy. And <laughs> gains, yeah, since 1992. Ah. Really? So neither of you get that one. Two, one to um, Rutger still. Um, How generous. <laughs> a dog the bounty hunter, if you're familiar with who he is. <laughs> I have no idea. He doesn't probably... Pay taxes. Uh, I think he does pay taxes. No, he, two, he owes two million uh, in taxes. So if you're listening, dog, can you pay up, please? Oh, so you can be able to hunt you down. <laughs> uh, and finally, um, Brenda Borton, Robin Brooks, Sean Cooper, Simon Haywood, Joe Jenkins, Roy Proctor, and Birgit Vollum. Do they pay taxes? Who are these people? Yeah, they do pay taxes. Um, Rutger, yes or no? <laughs> I have no idea who they are, but they, um, no, they're probably not. They don't. They're the, known as the Peace Tax Seven, who are conscientious objectors to uh, taxes being spent on war. Ah. So they, they've all huh. um, owed money for that in the past. 
they paid they paid most of their tax. They just took about ten percent away. Yeah, ten percent hmm. and gave it to charity. So maybe hmm. people love that. As always, a huge thank you to Colin St. Gabriels and all of our patrons for supporting the show. A very, very, very special thank you to Lily Hooper, Jim Clare and David Lejuenzi. Thank you, Lily, Jim and David. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please head over to our Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash pansycast to show your support. Links in the iTunes description. Finally, pick up a copy of Rutger Bregman's Utopia for Realists. It's an excellent book, which comes highly recommended by myself and Greg. We're giving away five copies of the book to celebrate the release of this episode. So head over to our socials to be in with a chance of winning. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, soothing voices of Dr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Rutger Bregman. Wow, thanks for having me. And me, Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. That was great, guys. Thanks. That was great fun. Thank you. That was good fun. Well, thanks. This was great. I always love these longer interviews.